Okay, here we are. Uh, Friday, April the 15th. The entrance to the Air Force Museum. It's just a long shot. Some of the missiles in the foreground. Along with the American flag. And of course the building. We're at the entrance. We're reading the uh, sign here. It says, Man's dream of powered flight was not realized until the beginning of the 20th century with the flights of the Wright brothers. In 1908, on the parade ground at Fort Myer, Virginia, the United States Air Force, first powered aircraft took flight to begin the first faltering steps to advance American military aviation. This is the story of the dedicated men and women who created and nurtured the evolving United States Air Force and who today sustain it in pursuit of peace for all. The entrance as we begin the tour of the uh, museum at Wright Patterson Air Force. The uh, mural at the beginning of the hall uh, depicting the uh, first flight of the original Wright Flyer in 1903. Picture of the uh, bust of Wilbur Wright, April. 1867 to May 1912. He was the older of the two brothers and he passed away of typhoid in 1912. This is the bust of Orville Wright, born in uh, August of 19 of 18, pardon me, 1871, lived until January of 1948. of the uh, airplane here. It's the Wright 1909 Military Flyer. And this was the uh, first airplane that was used by the Wright brothers for the United States Army. And at that time it was not the Air Force. Go ahead, you can read it there. I'm just going to... I'm backing up now trying to watch people behind me. There's Gerald standing there reading the plaque. It's been donated. Up above it in the wall, and we're trying to get a better picture, is a later airplane that was used about 1912, 1915. We'll find more on it in a few minutes. So the wind tunnel that the Wright brothers developed in 1901. They had read the uh, glider experiments of this famous German who had been killed, and they decided that they would build a glider. And their first attempt in 1901 failed, and so they went, came back from Kitty Hawk to Dayton, and they developed this wind tunnel, and they tested their designs in this wind tunnel. And it said that it had a fan on it that is capable of delivering a breeze of 25 to 35 mile an hour. And it was from there that they developed the design for the 1902 glider that they successfully flew, and again at Kitty Hawk. The plane suspended here, I don't know whether you can see it very well or not, is a uh, 1909 monoplane. It's a Beloit is the name of it. And it was one of the more practical, and it was used by the uh, Army as one of their trainers. Looking down now at this one, it's a 19 model, 1911 model Curtis. And again, it was one of the tricycle landing. It was one of the first ones 
with a uh, tricycle landing gear. At the uh, replica of the Wright B flyer, which was a later version, this one was put into service to replace uh, airplanes three and four that the Signal Corps had bought in 1908 and 1909. You notice it has two steering wheels on it and it has the uh, wheels on it for landing. But this was used and they trained pilots up until about the time of the First World War. We're looking now, suspended from the ceiling here, the standard J-1. This airplane was built by about four different airplane companies during World War I and was one of the mainstays of the uh, Army Signal Corps during the uh, First World War. 1,600 of these were actually built and were used in service and they had on order another 2,600. But when the armistice was signed, that uh, order was canceled and these airplanes were later improved and uh, they were known as a J-1 Junior and J-1H or several different designations, but this was the, the original J-1 of World War I. A mural on the wall designating the First World War and the uh, Doughboys on the ground and the Signal Corps, as it was known then, the Army Signal Corps, coming in with their J-1s that we just saw in the support situation. Lighting is in here, but uh, this is the uh, just a uh, J1 with the fabric from the wings and the fuselage taken off, and you can see that it's all wooden construction, both wings. The uh, frame for the fuselage is all wooden construction, and it's uh, held together, of course, by plates and screws, and also. It's, in, it's uh, reinforced by guy wires on it. But uh, you can see there's two seats in it, one for the pilot and I guess one for the bombardier navigator, but that's the J-1. Up above it is an unusual thing, it's called a Kettering bug. And uh, this thing would take off on a rail, which was designed to take off, and at a predetermined time, the uh, motor would quit on it. It had a motor and propeller. Uh, they would shut this motor off and when it did the wings would fold and the thing would plummet right to earth and it was a bomb and it was one of the first crude bombs it was developed but it never got into service during World War I the war was over here again is a trainer that was used during World War I to train the pilots it was a later model uh, very few of these uh, there was only about 126 of them I think manufactured by the end of the war here's a, a later version of it they were the first ones that I found in here that used the concept of the rotary engines. And uh, all of your rotary aircraft engines have a, an uneven number of cylinders. And this one in particular had nine cylinders. And it was used for training. It is a Curtis Jenny. And it's probably more famous than the other airplanes of the World War I. More of these were manufactured than any of the others, and I think uh, the sign said there were about 2,600 of them were manufactured. Many of them late in the war and never actually saw service, but they had uh, mounted cannons on them, some of them. Some of them had uh, bomb racks on them where they would carry a bombardier and he would just pitch the bombs, I guess, overboard at a target. But after the war, many of them were, as I say, had never been used and they were sold to the civilian population and the, uh, the old pilots modified these airplanes. And this was the, the mainstay of the barnstormers. Uh, you see the, the men that walked on the wings and had done the stunts. And they were souped up and modified Jennies. Most of them were JN, I think, 7Ds or something was the uh, uh, number of the airplane. But this was the one that you normally see the barnstormers working in. This is the famous soup with camel. It's the uh, F1 camel. It was manufactured. The uh, Royal British 
Air Force used it in the First World War. More of these airplanes were used than any other airplane. It was also the trickiest and the most dangerous to fly. Uh, more pilots lost their lives learning to fly this one and after they had learned to fly than any other airplane. But it was the best airplane, it was the best in the uh, uh, dogfights of the World War I with the Germans. Uh, almost 6,000, between five and 6,000 of these were actually built and flown. But you can just imagine the Red Baron sitting in there as he scored again and got his ace for the day. This is the famous soup with camel of World War I. The uh, French built Spade, probably the second most famous airplane of the Allied forces in World War I. Uh, it was built by the French. It's the Spade number no. seven. It was tested in 1916. It was so successful that it was put into immediate production and it appeared on the lines in early 1917. Almost 5,000 of these planes were built and this airplane was actually flown in 1962 and again in 1967. It's an original and uh, the uh, Allied forces of World War I, I mean the uh, French, the British, and the Americans. And uh, remember that the Americans, some of the American Air Corps flew camels, soup with camels, some of them flew this French-built spade. They were interchangeable and they had squadrons with each one. But there it is, a Spade 7, French-built, vintage 1916-1917. Takes. This is a mannequin, and this is a uh, World War I uh, pilot in uniform. And you can see the helmet, the goggles the close crop pants and the jacket. And I'll take you over to another display and I'll show you the wool leggings and the wool coats that they also wore. And also look at the boots. But there he is, your World War I Air Corps pilot. I'll try and see what happens here. But this is, uh, again, part of the uh, uniform that a World War I pilot would wear. This was a cold weather gear. And uh, you can look at the sheepskin uh, chaps, They're full chaps, leggings, uh, we'd call them hip boots, I guess, today. But they were lambskin and that they wore to keep warm in these open cockpit planes. Uh, incidentally, this uh, British built soup with flew as high as 12,000 feet. And so you can imagine what temperatures would be at that altitude. And you can see the uh, German markings above these two machine guns. Uh, a German by the name of Fokker, F-O-K-K-E-R, first developed a system of synchronizing machine guns so that they could fire through the arc of a propeller. And of course this gave the Germans, and he developed this in about 1915, gave the Germans a very distinct advantage, and hence he became uh, very famous. And the name Fokker, and it's also an airplane, is, uh, is known by everyone of, about the World War I. There were others that developed it, and they used a parabellum cartridge, it said, and I, I assume that the parabellum, uh, I'm not exactly sure what it designates. Today it's nine millimeter, and it doesn't say whether these were nine millimeters. I imagine they were larger than that. They may, they may have been nine millimeter, I'm not sure. But on the right, you see some American machine guns. And if you're in Dayton, the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is one of the largest Air Force bases in the nation. There were two separate airfields here years ago. One was used by the Wright brothers and it was in Wright Field. And the other one had a different name, but in 1918 there was a young Air, Air Corps lieutenant by the name of Frank Patterson who was testing a, a design to synchronize the firing of machine guns from airplanes. And he, the airplane crashed and he was killed. And the name of the airfield was changed and it became known as Patterson Field. And later when the uh, Air Force took the facility over for their logistics and development. They combined the two fields and it was named Wright-Patterson for the two fields in, in memory of these men. It's a very large airplane for this period of time. Its designation is a DWC, which stands for the Douglas World Cruiser. This airplane was developed in 1923 by the Douglas Corporation. 
and uh, the Navy bought four of these originally. And they were torpedo planes, and they were to cruise the uh, oceans of the world to prevent sneak attacks. Uh, if there was a submarine or a ship, they could bomb from them. And in 1924, four of these were delivered. They were named the Boston, the Chicago, the New Orleans, I believe the New York was the other one, and they were going to fly around the world and keep the water safe from sneak attacks. Uh, two of these airplanes crashed uh, on the initial flight. The Boston was later replaced by the Boston II, and this is one of the originals, and it was loaned to the uh, Air Force Museum uh, by the Los Angeles County Museum in 1957. But this is a 1924 vintage uh, DWC used, uh, proposed by the Navy as a torpedo bomber to keep the coast free. And it's a loaning uh, OA something or other was the designated. It was an amphibious airplane. It was developed again in 1923 after World War I and was deployed uh, on the coastal areas. Many of these were sent to Hawaii and also to the Philippine Islands because they can land either on water and or land. And they also were on a goodwill tour around the world which lasted for two years. And uh, it's, it's kind of an unusual, it's kind of a, by our standards, it's a strange looking bird. But it, uh, you can see the long engine on it, it was a Liberty engine. And uh, several of these were built. I think it said 45 of these were built and were actually in service by the U.S. Navy. And again, they were stationed near the coastal areas or large bodies of water. Quite an unusual plane. Model of the uh, Boeing P-12. And the Boeing Company developed this in the late 1920s, by 1927, of their own company expense. And it was sold to the government. It was one of the most widely used fighter planes in the uh, 1930s. And this plane was discovered in a garage in Chicago in the 1950s, uh, minus its wings. And they uh, put a set of wings on it, and brought it in here now, and it's on display. But this is the Boeing P-12, the famous, uh, most widely used fighter plane of the 1930s. Curtis uh, P-6E Hawk. This airplane was developed in the 1930s, one of the more powerful pursuit planes in the world. But because of the Depression and the austere times of the Depression, only 46 of these airplanes were ever built. This one was never flown in combat, but was flown during the 30s and retired. And as far as records go, this is the only remaining P-6E Hawk that is known to exist. And uh, it's here in the Air Force Museum. It's quite an airplane. If that had a cockpit, a closed cockpit on it, it looks like it would really fly and really do the job. This was manufactured, of course, by the Martin Corporation. In about 1934, this plane came on the market. It's got kind of an interesting nose on it. They had a revolving gun turret on it, the pilot set back of that. It was an all-metal design. The uh, fabric, uh, instead of being fabric, it was all metal. A good many of these were manufactured. Uh, they were sold to some of the Air Forces in South America, also to the Netherlands and a few others. Very few remain, and this is one of them. Uh, General Hap Arnold flew one of these and was credited as saying that this was the modern miracle of the Air Force in the 1930s. A good many of these were on the ground at Pearl Harbor when the Japanese attacked on Pearl Harbor Day and they were destroyed. If you see many of the uh, newsreel clips of what happened at Pearl Harbor, you'll see these sitting on the runways. And the Japanese almost crippled our fleet. They were later replaced by the B-17s and the B-18s. This was the first uh, real bomber that America had. It had uh, the gun turn on the front, had internal bomb racks and a, and a system for delivering bombs. 
quite an invention for the 1930s. Craft UC-43 Traveler. This airplane was developed in the late 1930s. It's unusual. I don't know whether from this angle you can see it or not, but it's a bi-winged airplane. The wings are staggered. The uh, lower wing sets farther forward than does the upper wing. And during the war, in the early stages of World War II, they needed executive airplanes and uh, liaison airplanes, and a good many of these were produced. This airplane was actually uh, flown by the British and was donated to the museum by a retired general and was flown to Wright Patterson Air Force Base and placed in the museum in 1974. The fighter plane was developed in 1937, late 1937, early 1938. It was the first all metal uh, with an enclosed cockpit of any of the fighter planes that were put into service by the United States government. It's interesting to note that in 1938, 60 of these were ordered by the Japanese, and it was the only American-made, American-designed airplane that was used in World War II by the Japanese. It's the uh, P-35, which is the forerunner of the P-47, which we'll see a little later. But uh, it's amazing. It's in excellent condition as a tri-blade propeller, the enclosed cockpit developed in 1937 and 1938. Again, uh, the airplane was developed in 1938. Uh, England and France had secured these airplanes in 1939 and used them in 1939 and 1940 against the Germans. But of course they were uh, so badly uh, obsolete compared to the Messerschmitt's 109s that a good many of them were shot down. They just were not capable of sustaining the uh, war. The remaining ones were transferred, some of them to Hawaii and some of them to the Philippines. And when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, of the few airplanes that got off of the ground, two of these uh, P-35s were airborne and were used to fight against the Japanese. As you viewed earlier, the uh, P-36 this was the advanced version of the uh, P-36, designated the P-40. Almost 18,000 of these airplanes were manufactured. A uh, good many of the countries throughout the world flew them, and although the uh, Germans had airplanes that would outmaneuver them, outclimb them, this airplane was known for its uh, dependability and its ruggedness. And even though it was outclassed, it was a very serviceable airplane. But here again, this is the P-40. You can see the tiger's shark's teeth and, and uh, the front of the airplane. A good many of our pilots decorated the airplanes in various ways during World War II. Different angle. These P-40s were used uh, in most of the theaters of war, and of course they were famous for the flying tigers. This was this is where this group got its uh, got its start. The famous flying tigers flew these P-40s. We're looking now at one of the more widely known airplanes of World War II. It's the British Spitfire. And 20,000 of these airplanes were manufactured. The airplane was actually designed by the British in the mid-1930s, 1935 and 1936. And when they entered the war in 1939 against Germany, this was the mainstay of the uh, British and French air forces. Look at the machine guns mounted in the wings of this airplane. The Spitfire would fly 280 mile an hour, and it had a ceiling of, believe it or not, 43,000 feet. This is the British Spitfire. On display here is a World War II U.S. Air Force uh, motorcycle. This is a 1941 version of the model WLA, built in 1941. About 90,000 of these vehicles were manufactured for the United States and our allies during World War II, and uh, they were used. And I'll try and back off here and get a complete picture. I hope it shows up in this case of the lighting the way it is. But this is a 1941 military Harley-Davidson. Notice the saddlebags 
and the gun scabbard there on the uh, front fender of this motorcycle. But I don't have time to do a great lot on every one of them. Some of them were kind of crude, but they were used for various trainers, which basically is what, what you're looking at here. Some of them still had the uh, cloth fabrics. Some of them utilized uh, all metal fabrics. They were all used, and in the background is a P40. I'm going to turn around here now and show you the Link Trainer that probably you're familiar with. This is a simulator, and uh, they couldn't, uh, they put men in here and they'd simulate flight as best they could. These Link Trainers, incidentally, uh, were advanced and used, and I suppose they're outdated today, but they were used as late as the 1950s and early 60s to give. Uh, pilots their early training. They could blindfold them and put them in this uh, capsule and simulate uh, instrument flying. And uh, the thing would elevate, turn, and bank much like a regular flight. The glider. And again, I don't know how all of this is going to turn out from the lights, but this is a, this is a World War II glider. A good many people can remember those flying over, uh, over Missouri. Many of those pilots were trained in Kansas, and I think some of them over at Knob Noster. Here's another picture, of, of course, of a World War II trainer. Uh, you can see where the uh, trainee would sit and the instructor would sit behind them. Here's another one that's uh, known as the Texan. And I'm sure you've seen these in movies where they used them uh, to fly. Up above is kind of a strange bird. It's a uh, it's called the uh, Sandpiper. The Germans developed this during World War II. It's kind of an auto gyro, they called it. As we sit here and look at this thing, it's so crude that uh, I, I, not much that would really scare me in flying, but I, I'd have second thoughts about getting into this thing. It's really a, a contraption and a half. It's just an accident waiting to happen. Said several of these were manufactured, and this is one of the few that's known to exist, and I can believe it. You can see the uh, plexiglass dome on the front of this. And this was a commercial airliner. It was a Beechcraft Model 18 commercial airliner. You've seen many of these. But during the war, the American ingenuity, they needed a uh, trainer to train bombardiers. And so they simply took the nose of this airplane, glassed it in, and let the bombardier set in the nose of this airplane. And almost 90%, the sign says 90% of the 45,000 bombardiers that were trained by the Air Force in the uh, United States uh, Army Air Force during World War II were trained in a Beechcraft A-11, uh, nicknamed the Kansan. Up above it is probably one of the most famous airplanes in the world. If you all think of a Piper Cub, you're looking at a Piper Cub. This is a J3. The doors fold up, the, the glass part, the lower part folds down. You set two, one behind the other. If you're flying by yourself, you have to sit in the back seat to get this thing uh, to balance. And these airplanes were manufactured in 1940-41, and the Air Force ordered about 9,000 of these. And there wasn't much that they weren't actually used for. They call it the grasshopper, you call it the Piper Cup. There it is. But this is one of the trainers, and they have a, a couple of mannequins in full uniform sitting in this uh, cockpit of this airplane. And they allow you to walk up on a uh, platform here and to look in. But you can see the two trainers as they're preparing for flight in this uh, World War II vintage trainer. It's quite interesting how crude these airplanes actually were. 1904 Chinook glider. You've all heard of Chinook Field, a famous man by the name of Chinook, and he was an early pioneer. And this is a hang glider. They had to be in an area where they had enough wind that they could just jump off, I guess, and take this thing because they just hung down below it by their arms or some method or harness. 
the Wright brothers uh, had studied this famous German who was trying to develop a glider. And they took his uh, aer aerodynamic, or whatever you call it, tables, and tried to incorporate it into their own design. And after they developed it here in Dayton, they had to have a place to fly it. Of course, a glider takes a constant wind. And the Wright brothers took the records of the United States Weather Bureau and scrutinized them, and they found out that Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, had a constant wind blowing from 25 to 35 knots. And so it was the closest area to, to Dayton, and they took the glider to Kitty Hawk. Not only was it a place that had this, uh, the winds, but it also was sand dunes and rolling hills. Uh, it didn't have a great lot of trees or other vegetation on it, which suited their needs. And so they took their first glider in 1901. It was not successful. They came back to Dayton and developed a wind tunnel, and you saw the reproduction of the right wind tunnel a little earlier. And they came up with a newer design, which had the airfoil on the front and the rudder on the back. And in 1902, again, they went to Kitty Hawk, and they actually got this glider to fly. They came back to Dayton, and in the winter of 1902-1903, they motorized it, took it back to Kitty Hawk, and flew it successfully in the uh, 1903. It was the first powered flight of man in history, and it was made in Kitty Hawk. That's the reason, even though they were from Dayton, did their manufacturing and their experiments here, they did not have sufficient wind velocity to test the gliders and, and have the uh, facilities here, and so they took them to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and that's why the flights were made there, STA, a beautiful airplane has a metal fuselage, it's a low mono-winged airplane, a dual cockpit, and uh, this airplane was developed in 1939. It was used as a trainer, and a good many of the fighter pilots received their initial training in this Ryan. Uh, the Air Force had a, uh, the Army Air Force had another number designated, but it was known as a Ryan STA, and it's really quite a sharp airplane. It was just a a military version of a commercial airplane built by the Ryan Corporation. But it is really a, a fancy airplane. It's here in the main, one of the main hallways of the museum. They, they have, of course, any number of them, but one of the most uh, famous of the uh, generals. This is Lieutenant General Jimmy Doolittle. This is his portrait that hangs in the uh, Air Force Museum. There's no date or anything on it, just caption, Lieutenant General James Doolittle. Throughout the hall, they have uh, a good many posters that were used during World War II. This one says, Save Freedom of Speech by War Bonds. Here's another one. If you can see it, I hope you can with the light shining on it and move around here. A very famous general, of course, Douglas MacArthur, and it says, we shall win or we shall die. And again, they're urging you to buy U.S. war bonds. They've got a light shining on that one, and I don't know whether with the glass whether we can get it or not. Here you have various reproductions. It's titled the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders. You can see in the display cases some of the uh, uniforms, the leather flight jackets, the helmets, the goggles, uh, some of the things that they wore. These are wartime pictures uh, depict, depicting Doolittle as he uh, is flying from the carriers and he's getting prepared to raid Tokyo. The Doolittle Tokyo Raiders. Just too much here and too little time that I can't get it all in. I'm just trying to pick and choose what I think is interesting here. Again, they have a, a light illuminating it. I don't know whether we're going to pick it up or not. It's titled Combat Europe. It shows all, not all, but a good many of the scenes that were taken by photographers during the Second World War. AA, AF enters combat from England. And on around to Algiers, 
French Morocco in 1942, North Africa, 1942, 1943, some of the memorabilia and the photographs. Here again we have mannequins showing the uniform and the garb of our servicemen that was worn during World War II. And we see the map of Russia, map of Japan, map of the United States imposed here, combat Pacific, again showing the, some of the pictures of photographs that were actually taken. There's Gerald, he's just now trying to get out of the picture. I'm going to get him in there anyway, just to prove that he was here. But this is some of the picture and some of the history depicted on the walls here in uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Museum. World War II torpedo. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, no damage, but it's on display here. Fired at many of our ships. Shows a, a B-17 that crash landed in New Guinea. It was coming into a jungle landing strip and the uh, landing gear on the aircraft uh, folded. And this is how it wound up. The caption, and of course, the story about it. Picture of this. This is a uh, Clark uh, Caterpillar type tractor that was developed during the World War II. These were very small and very compact. And the uh, because of their lightness and their smallness of size, that during the war in Bermuda, these were airlifted in one night by gliders. The tractors and other men, and they brought these in, landed them, and within just about three days, in the jungles of Bermuda, they had cleared an airstrip that allowed the airplanes to come in and to land and bring men and material in for the men fighting in Bermuda. But this was one of the inventions that was made. Clark uh, eventually developed them, and then later on another company took over, and there were several hundred of these manufactured, and some of them were actually parachuted into jungle areas to clear land strips, landing strips. Those that were taken during, taken during World War II, the top one shows a B-17 as it's flying through flag. This one I'm trying to zoom in on shows a B-24 uh, coming in from a fight, flak area, and it's number two engine is smoking. I hope you can see it. The trailer smoke fly uh, behind this uh, B-24. This is some of the actual fighters and flaks, what's called here, on some of the bombing runs. pictures shows an AT-20 just before it began its final plunge as it was on fire. The bridge that had been bombed, some of the crew members of one of these planes. It developed, was developed by the Germans in World War II. It was known as the V-2. And here it is. This, this rocket was actually operational and the Germans fired it at many of the cities including London and Brussels, the lay uh, several more of these cities in Europe. I can't read the sign from this distance, but uh, it's an actual V-2 rocket engine developed by the Germans in World War II. As you can see, I get a shot of this. The Germans in late 1944 and 1945 entered the war with jet fighter planes. This one here is, is the first German jet fighter to see combat duty during World War II. Needless to say, these airplanes were far superior to any of the propeller-driven airplanes of the British, the French, or the Americans. This airplane uh, not only was maneuverable, 
but had a top speed of 522 mile an hour, far outmatching anything in the propeller class. And uh, fortunately, uh, the Americans and the British were able to locate the uh, plants that these fighters were being built in, and the numerous bombing raids were conducted not only on the manufacturing plants, but also on the airstrips. And fortunately, we were able to destroy the existing jet fighters, and consequently, uh, the war was over before the Germans could get many of these into service. But they were far superior to anything that, that we had during World War II. General shot now in the museum of different airplanes. You can see the one up there with the Red Cross marking on it. It's different fighters, different trainers, all hanging from different positions. Here's a Piper Cub that's been modified and used. Here's another uh, bomber that was obsolete before the war ever started, but was used. I'm standing now in front of a B-25, and I'm going to turn around and try. Uh, General Jimmy Doolittle made it very popular flying it off of the aircraft carriers on his raids in Tokyo, and uh, one of the most serviceable, one of the most famous airplanes of World War II, particularly in the Pacific Division, the B-25. B-24D, one of the most famous, most versatile bombers of World War II. Because of its long range, its payload, its dependability, this aircraft was used in every theater of war in the Second World War. This plane that you see here was actually used in North Africa in combat. It's the uh, same model as was the famous Lady Be Good, which went down in North Africa during World War II and was discovered in the desert in 1959. But this again is the famous B-24. Of course, there's Gerald standing in front of the B-24. <clears throat> we'll not name it, uh, but it says something about strawberry on it. But uh, his dad was a tail gunner on one of these B-24s during World War II. It's a four-engine plane, a famous, famous bomber used by the United States Army Air Force during World War II. We're going to walk around now and see if we can get some more shots and the tail turret Perhaps we can get a good shot of that. To the uh, tail section of this B-24, you can see the dual tails. You can see the gun. Mr. Peebler was, was a gunner on this type of an airplane. It was from this area that he performed his assigned duties. Now, again, these planes have been modified and different models of them. Uh, this was actually flown in combat in 43 and 44. So there evidently were some later models of it made. But there's the, uh, there's the old gun turret on the back. It's interesting to note, and you can't see it for this display, we'll move to another area here. You can see a plastic bubble up there with two machine guns on it. And that was a gunner that was there. These things were armed front, rear, sides, and I guess every other way with machine guns to protect themselves. There was a gun turret there. Some of them, I think, were later modified and had gun turrets so on the bellies. They had, on both sides, on the fuselage toward the tail, they had areas where gunners could point guns out. There, evidently, there was no glassed-in area or anything. They just stuck out the uh, side of the airplane. There was a deflector in front of this window to deflect the air away from it, and the gunners on both sides would sit there and fire from the, from the open window. A few of the of the turret. We're going to walk around here. I'm sure the pictures aren't going to be too steady and we're going to get some light reflection. But we're looking from ground level now directly into the turret, the rear of this airplane. So Strawberry <clears throat> Bitch was the name of this airplane. And it was a true to life, honest to goodness combat. B-24. Of course, we're looking at the most famous 
vehicle of World War II other than their 4x4 trucks. And that was the good old World War II Willys Jeep. And there sits one right there, and I'll read the caption on it later on, setting under the wing of another bomber, and we'll see what it says here. Flying Fortress. This airplane, believe it or not, was first developed in 1934. The first one was manufactured and flown in July of 1935. But here again, because of the depression and austere times, very few of these were manufactured. But when the war broke out in uh, 1941, the production was accelerated and from probably 35 or 40, the production went to 12, over 12,000 of these. It's a four-engine bomber, the first four-engine bomber in the world. And like I say, it was developed, and I'm sure that the later armaments, the gun turrets, everything were added on. The plane has been modified several times, but the basic design was, was uh, first flown in 1935. The shot here of this B-24, sitting here. You can see the markings on it, the tail section and everything. Uh, it's so crowded in here that they have other aircraft sitting underneath it. One of them in particular is this German jet. And this was the jet that the Germans developed during World War II. It was flown in combat against American forces and had the bombers of the uh, Army Air Force not desert, not destroyed the uh, manufacturing plants and the airstrips where these were stationed. Germany would have had a very distinct advantage over any one with these jet airplanes. They were put into service in 1944 and 45. Down here and, and get off base so much, but as I was panning the uh, B-24, and this uh, German Messerschmitt 262 is sitting under its wing. It was the uh, uh, photo that I showed you on the wall a few minutes ago. This plane, believe it or not, was first developed in 1938 by the Messerschmitt Company. Uh, because of production problems, it, it was originally designed as a turboprop uh, airplane, but because of production problems, it was never really put into production. In the early 1940s, 42-43, they developed the pure jet engine and it was converted to a jet engine. Hitler finally wanted it designated as a bomber, uh, more so than a fighter plane. And finally, in 1943, he signed an order uh, to mass produce it. But because of the lack of available parts, the heavy bombing raids on the plants, the Allied forces literally destroyed about 300 of these on the ground uh, by bombing and fighter strafes. Very few of these actually saw combat, although some did, and when they did, they scored heavily on uh, the American, British, and French uh, bombing raids. But because of lack of parts, lack of fuel, and lack of trained pilots, the Germans were actually unable to get very many of these in service. But had they been in service, Germany certainly would have had a very definite advantage with these pure jets. This one was brought to the United States in 1945 for evaluation. It was captured and brought over here we studied it, and of course some of ours probably the basic designs uh, pretty well followed our early uh, jet fighters. This one was restored in 
the late 1950s and was brought to the museum, but it does not have any of the German markings on it, but it's just the Messerschmitt 262 jet fighter, bomber. Okay, again, we're, we're looking. There's so many airplanes here from World War II. This is, a, of course, a glider. It's called the Little Girl, and it's suspended here. But it's one of the troop gliders that was used. Again, we're looking at the prop-driven fighters and trainers that were used during World War II. There's just so much here that I don't really have the time. Look at the unique design on the propeller hub of this one. The spiral, can you imagine that propeller turning and that spiral, what it would look like as it was in flight. Again, we're panning around. Uh, I hope you can see that early helicopter that's up there on, on suspension. Maybe I can get some more of those. Uh, here's another glider that's suspended. Another one, I'm not sure quite what it is. We're looking now at, uh, I guess this is a B-29 ahead of us. And we'll look at it in just a few minutes. Another two-engine fighter bomber. Again, another view of this uh, B-17 that's in here. Let me see. Again, the uh, silhouette, the markings on the B-24. And here again, in the distance, you recognize the B-24, four-engine with its distinctive tail design. We come around now. I hope because of the lighting we'll be able to see this. But this is the B-17, the Ford engine. Uh, has the tricycle, or it has the uh, rear wheel type of uh, landing gear. It's not a tricycle landing gear. We come on around here now to the B-26. And again, this was a workhorse that was originally sent to the South Pacific, but because of its ability and medium level bombing from 10 to 12,000 feet. Uh, it saw a lot of service in the European war. And by the war's end, 20, uh, pardon me, by the time the war was over, 5,200 of these had been manufactured. Of course, we're looking now into the nose of a B-29. These were used primarily long distance flights overseas in the uh, South Pacific. I'll get some different pans of these, but these, probably these four airplanes were the four wideless used airplanes in World War II. On in front of this B-29, I'm going to zoom in. I hope I can get the, the decal on this painting on it. It's called the Boxcar. This airplane was flown in the uh, South Pacific. Most of the B-29s, they were developed in 1940. A few of them saw service in the European war, but because of their ability to fly long distance, carry these gigantic bomb loads, most of them saw service in the South Pacific. This, Pacific, this particular airplane, this B-29 here, was flown over Nagasaki. And from this airplane, the second atomic bomb was dropped upon Japan, that being on the city of Nagasaki. And because of the dropping of that second bomb, Japan surrendered. But this was the airplane that carried the atomic bomb that flew over Nagasaki. These planes were used in World War II, and again in the Korean War, they were used on bombing runs uh, over North Korea in the early 1950s. But this is the boxcar. You can see the, uh, the emblem on it, the logo on it. I hope you can see, I'm going to let this focus in here now, down right below it. Maybe I can get up here a little closer where it says Nagasaki. But this airplane actually carried the second atomic bomb over Nagasaki. I shot this plane here, I didn't know what it was. But this is a Messerschmitt 109. This plane was developed again in the uh, middle 1930s. And, uh, during World War II, production of this airplane was greatly escalated by the Germans. It's estimated that about 33,000 of these airplanes were made, and this was the mainstay of the German fighters during the early part of World War II. Messerschmitt 109. P-51 fighter. This plane was originally developed as a reconnaissance plane. 
Americans, in cooperation with the British, experimented with this airplane, and by using Rolls-Royce engines in it, it was one of the fastest, one of the most maneuverable airplanes during World War II. This airplane was used in, in all theaters of war, but primarily as a, as a fighter escort for our bombers over the European theater in the 1940s. It was also used in Korea during the 1950s. This is the P-51 Mustang, probably one of the most or more famous of the fighters that was used. And of course, they have the mannequin up on the uh, wing of it, and he's installing a, a cartridge of, of uh, ammunition. Uh, below it, you can see a bomb mounted. It was actually a fighter bomber, but it was the P-51, the Mustang. And again, it's just amazing how many of these airplanes were manufactured. The sign said there that there were almost 18,000 of these airplanes manufactured by the United States during World War II. I went back to that Messerschmitt 109 and reread the sign, and sure enough, uh, I, I just it just staggers me to think that 33,000 of those Messerschmitts were were actually manufactured. 18,000 of these uh, Mustangs, some of these big bombers, 5,000 were manufactured during the war. This is the P-47 Thunderbolt, another famous airplane that was used. I'm walking around here trying to get a little better view of it. But this is a P-47 that was also used, the old Thunderbolt. But probably of all of them, the P-51, the old Mustang, was the most famous airplane fighter in World War II. Uh, in a different place away from some of the other bombers, but you'll all recognize this as the B-25. This is the one that Billy Mitchell flew on his raids over Tokyo. And again, almost 10,000 of these planes were manufactured during World War II. Down below it here on the stand is a 75 millimeter gun. This was the nose gun that was on these B-25s. A 50 caliber machine gun was considered a large. But imagine a 75 caliber machine gun on a plane. These were used on raids over Tokyo. They were used as treetop uh, bombing raids. And they were used in the primary, uh, primarily in the South Pacific. But this is it, the B-25. And so we have to add it to the other four bombers, the 17, 24, 25, B-29s, the World War II bombers unusual airplane. It's one that many of us are familiar with. We've heard the designation of a P-39. This is a P-39 fighter. And it's a rather unusual airplane. It was first developed in 1939. It was first flown here at Wright-Patterson Airfield. By the time of Pearl Harbor, 600 of these had already been purchased by the Army Air Force and were ready for service. This airplane has seen service in, in all theaters of World War II, and it's unique in the fact that if you look right below the cockpit, you can see a row of, uh, it looks like pipes extending out of there, and that's exactly what they are. They're exhaust, they're exhaust pipes. This is the first plane that was developed with an engine that was behind the pilot. And down below, I hope we can get a picture of this, to the left is a, a picture of the engine. And you can see those exhaust pipes as they stick out behind the uh, pilot. You can see the propeller shaft. You can see the uh, support bearing in the center of that shaft. And you can see it go on to the gearbox and into the propeller. Now, almost uh, 9,500 of these P. Uh, 39s were built. And of that number, almost half of them were sent to the Russians. And this was the Russian Air Force mainstay of fighter planes during World War II, was this P-39. It's unique, it had some peculiar handling characteristics, but it was basically a good airplane. But it was unusual in the fact that, like I say, it had the engine behind the cockpit, the long propeller shaft running under the pilot, into the reduction area, into the uh, reduction gears, into the propeller of this airplane, the P-39, developed here at Wright, at Wright Air Force or Wright Field. It was a liquid-cooled engine was a, that was used in it. You can see the shaft, but I want, what I wanted you to notice was in the uh, hub of the propeller. 
the cannon was mounted in the and shot through the hub of that propeller. It shot before, they didn't have to synchronize it with the propeller because it extended in front of the propeller. And you can see the uh, carriage, uh, the case that uh, carried the uh, cartridges and uh, the barrel of the gun as it extended through the hub of this P-39. Quite an unusual airplane. And again, 9,500 of these were produced, a staggering number. And half of them were given to the Russians. So many things that you just can't get them all in as, as you walk through. But these two bombs in particular, I want to show you. The first one here on the left is called the VB-1 Amazon guided bomb. And this bomb was actually used and was dropped from B-24s. And it destroyed many bridges and, and things, but it was the first radio guided bomb that was used uh, during World War II. Next to it is a larger one. It's called the VB-3 Razon guided bomb. It had been developed in the uh, pilots and crews on the B-29s in the South Pacific had requested these bombs, but the war ended before any of them could be dropped. But again, it was a radio control bomb. The bombardier could actually control the uh, direction of the bomb by these veins and things on this bomb. It could extend its range and could pinpoint its, uh, its dropping. VB-1, VB-2, radio control bombs developed during World War II. This was the first jet fighter plane built by the United States government. It was personally ordered by General H.H. H. Hap Arnold. It was first uh, conceived in 1941. The, Bri the British had we'll the in 25 minutes. developed a jet engine if you wish to visit our gift shop, and they so freely the shared their the whittle we'll engine with the, the American engineers. And this airplane was developed and tested. It was developed in 1942 and tested in 1943. It had a cruise of about 400 mile an hour, something less than the German Messerschmitt 260s. But uh, it is not said whether it was ever used. The, the film, or the uh, plaque doesn't say whether it was ever put into combat use during World War II. But this was the uh, prototype of the first jet aircraft uh, developed by the United States Air Force. So this plane was, was taken from Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico and was brought to the museum in 1959. P-59, America's first jet prototype fighter plane. The announcement that the museum would be closing in 25 minutes. This is a, a, a Bell uh, 1X uh, jet rocket airplane. It was first flown in October of 1954 and was brought to the museum in 1959. And as you can see, the long pointed nose on it, it's a rocket plane. It was first flown in 1952, unlike uh, many of the other rocket planes, the X-1 and the X-15 that was later produced, this one took off on its own power. But because of production problems, it was never uh, fully developed and put into occupational or into use. But it was, an, it was a supersonic uh, type of an airplane that would take off from Edwards Air Force Base in A-2. This plane was actually flown, of course, different from the uh, X-3, which took off on its own power. This one was dropped from a, uh, a mothership that was uh, designed to fly at speeds up to 4,000 mile an hour and to add up altitudes of 50,000 feet above the Earth. The pilots of these X-15s were actually uh, the first pilots, uh, I guess, to fly at such gigantic speeds. But this is the X-15A-2 we're looking at here. Here. And it's the uh, P something or other twin Mustang. It's the same as the, uh, as the P-51 Mustang, but it has twin bodies. I guess it carries twin pilots, twin guns, and everything. <laughs> it's, it's quite an oddity to see uh, a double airplane. It's J. Of course, you all know that the Strategic Air Command flew these airplanes. This thing is so big and so huge that there isn't any way that I can get, a, get it in the 
camcorder the way they have it in here. You can see the pusher type engines on it. The original B36s did not have jet engines. This B36J, they had added jet engines at the uh, end of each wing on it. They had pusher type engines. And this thing was flown in here to Wright Field in 1959, was brought into this museum, and the building was actually built around it. This thing is enormous. And uh, as I say, there is no way that I can do justice to this airplane in this type of a setting. Okay, I panned awful quick here, but there's the cockpit area of this B-36J. You can see <laughs> that little clod hopper there, kind of a little jet thing, an experimental type. Another Air Force jet sitting under the wing of this B-36. And in the distance you can see a display of you see I'm moving, I know. But there's one of the tires and the landing gears. Gigantic. So big the building was built around it. Last flew in 1956 J. You can't begin to sit from the airplanes that are put under the wings of it. But on both wings they have two jet engines that have been added on to the later versions. There are six pusher type engines on this airplane fuselage goes. I'll take a close-up if I can of the... there's the landing gear under it. These tires alone are just unbelievable in size. Fuselage on this thing. There sits an airplane under it. You can see the tail. And I've got a wide-angle lens on this. I've got it just as far out as I can get it. Serial number, the uh, identification number on it is 22220. But you can see these airplanes sitting under the tail of this B 36 to give you some idea of just exactly how large this dude is. I mean, it is big. A cutaway this is an F 86 Sabre jet. This is one of the later models. I think it's designated with the prefix H. Uh, they, they came out with an F 86 in the early 1950s was, was flown in Korea and as they were changed and modified and improved by the series, the later series would be would be designated as B, C, D, E. This is H, I believe. And you can see the cutaway on it, how the frame and all of uh, some of the instrumentation was, was developed into this. But this was one of the workhorses of uh, the early uh, Air Force the Sabre jets were flown extensively in Korea uh, during the early 1950s. And again, this thing is sitting, this F-86 is sitting under the tail of this B-36. You just cannot imagine the enormous size of this one airplane. There's the 36, here's another jet sitting under it. Here's a helicopter sitting under it. Still more airplanes under each wing of this B-36. It's just so big that in this uh, building, there's no way to get a shot of the entire airplane. We hear on the loudspeaker a while ago that uh, there was only 25 minutes until the museum closes. It closes at five o'clock. It's now approaching five till, and we still haven't begun to scratch the airplanes and the notices. I've just walked through here and taken shots of various airplanes and uh, we got here about two o'clock and it's now going on five. You could literally spend days in here reading and what, looking at the pictures and, and studying the airplanes and we haven't even got to the annex yet. <laughs> Museum's closing in five minutes. We've just got in now to the area where the space capsules are. This is one here, it's uh, the Stargazer gondola and you can see the men in it. We're looking now at the Mercury capsule and uh, we'll walk up toward it. I'm gonna just walk up here because we gotta get out of here. They're gonna lock us in. This is the Mercury space capsule. This is the Gemini uh, space capsule that was used. Some of these are actual uh, capsules that were used. 
I'm going to see if I can get a picture of the interior of this thing. I hope I can get it. There's where the astronauts sat. There's some of the instrumentation. This is a cutaway that's been developed in here so you can see into it. How would you like to muster up courage to sit down in that thing and have you blown into outer space with that and hope that you'd get back? Looking now at the Apollo 15, there have been so many of these space shots, I forgot exactly what the uh, significance of this is. But if you can see, and I hope you can, the burn spot on this. This was actually flown. And as it re-entered the Earth, the uh, friction and whatever actually discolored. And you can imagine this thing, the intense heat, and how it's like being in a little trap door. Coming back to Earth and you're going to land out in the middle of the Pacific somewhere and you hope that there's a boat there to pick you up. But there's the Apollo 15 space cap. Sims closed and we're outside. They've run us out. We haven't even got on the line here. Again, it's cold and windy today. This is a B-50, which is a modified uh, B-29. They were used for tankers. You can see the uh, four engines on them. They also added jet engines so that they could get added lift and use these to refuel the tank. Got to get to the parking lot. They've just announced that the gates are going to close in 15 minutes. And, uh, but this is some of the line and airplanes that are even outside of this museum. They have another. The what? Yeah, they had that done last fall. Okay, we're over now at the uh, Annex B. And uh, this is. These uh, pictures of the Wright brothers were painted on this building last fall. The Air Force used it as the uh, center for their 40th anniversary. And it was painted. I'll turn around and take another picture here of another. Okay, here's another one of the hangars in which they have the Wright brothers and the early Air Force planes yeah, painted on it. And this whole area, this parking lot was used as the uh, main staging area for the Air Force's 40th anniversary in uh, late September of 1987. No. I mean, Blowing again, I need to get a cover for the microphone. Here's a, an airplane, it's, it's uh, painted on the side, the Ohio National Air Guard, but uh, it's a uh, military version. But uh, many years ago, Boeing made this airplane. It was called the uh, Northwest Airlines had them. It was called a Strata Cruiser. And they flew these airplanes up until the advent of the uh, Pure Jets and the 707s. And behind it's just another Air Force plane. I'm going to turn around now and take a shot of a SR 71. And you're looking now at the. Uh, you were talking to yourself, by the way. Yeah, everybody thinks I'm talking to myself. But this is the SR-71. Uh, it's a fighter bomber, is that right, Joe? That is reconnaissance. Reconnaissance. But you can see it. They were originally going to have one bomber, one fighter, one reconnaissance, all the same design, but they went all reconnaissance. But Okay, they dropped the fighter bomber, and it's all reconnaissance now. You can see other airplanes. A constellation there in the uh, rear with the uh, radar hump on the back of it. Here's a uh, Korean vintage jet fighter. Looking now at the background of a, of a DC-3, an old uh, tri-engine airplane there in the, in the background. These airplanes will be completely refurbished and uh, will be taken into the museum. But uh, you can see them. They're just sitting here on the apron at this uh, annex to the museum. The annex ordinarily is open. Don't let the gate guard see the kid like that. It's Don't closed. Don't let the gate guard see your kid like that. 
They're kind of just at another area. And these airplanes again are all have been brought in here, and they will be uh, completely refurbished. There's the hangar again. This is Saturday morning. Let me get the date on this. <laughs> Joe's complaining it's cold. So. <laughs> City fella, you know. But this is the annex, and it's closed today. And ordinarily it's open every day of the year except Christmas and New Year's, but because they're building on... Okay, we're back now to the uh, Air Force Museum. And uh, we're looking now at uh, one of the trainers there. Next to it is another vintage fighter. On down the line is a uh, B-29. It's called the B-30 something or other, B-35, I think, which is converted into a tanker plane. But actually what it is, it's a, it's a World War II vintage B-29 that uh, they have made into a tanker. And then on down the line, the uh, darker plane is the B-1 bomber. I think it's the B-1A or something uh, bomber. Of course, it's it's all you have here is the fuselage and the wings. All of the electronics and all of the instrumentation has been removed. But it's here on display. And then you can look on down the line and we'll have to move on down to get the rest of these planes in the picture. But there's the, the B-1 here on the uh, display line at the Air Force Museum. <laughs> the, uh, at the uh, B-1, a little closer vantage point, you can see that uh, some of the paint's beginning to peel. I understand now that most of the fighters and the bombers, the Air Force is using this drab, kind of an olive green. It's used kind of as a concealment. Uh, somehow, I don't know the reason for it, but most of them are being painted this color. But here you have the B-1B. This is the uh, sign underneath this uh, bomber. Rockwell International B-1A. And I think this is, I call it the B-1B, but it's the B-1A. The sign reads, the B-1A's wing, B-1A swing wing strategic bomber, a blended wing body designed intended for high speed, low altitude penetration missions. Eventually it will replace the aging B-52 bomber operational since the 1950s. The B-1 uses shorter runways than the B-52 can carry twice the payload and has a smaller radar profile than the B-52s, making it harder for the enemy to detect. Construction of the first prototype began in late 1972, and the first flight occurred on December 23, 1974. By the end of June 1977, three B-1As had made 118 flights, totaling 646 hours of flying time, with over 21 hours at supersonic speed and more than 35 hours at uh, high speeds below 500 feet. B-1A production was canceled by presidential decision on June 30th, 1977, but in January 1982, as a result of another presidential decision, the U.S. Air Force dedicated Rockwell International, directed Rockwell International to begin production of 100 B-1Bs, improved versions of the B-1A. The aircraft on display, serial S-N-76, 0174 is the fourth and last B-1A built. It was first flown in February 1979 and was used primarily as an avionics test bed for the B-1B program. Unlike the other B-1As which had escape modulars, this B-1A has ejection seats which are standard on the B-1B. After the B-1B became operational on September 30th, 1986, this B-1A's role in the program came to an end. The aircraft was flown to the U.S. Air Force Museum on December 16th, 
1986. They're just a flyover of three fighter jets here. If I had a telescopic lens on, I could see them better. But you can see them as they pass over, flying in formation here on this Saturday afternoon. Another uh, part of the uh, ramp area, looking down the aisle at the lineup of some of the planes that are on display here. In the background, you can see uh, part of the base. We'll zoom in. The uh, hangar there with the airplane, the hangar with the uh, profile of the Wright brothers. Uh, the one that you're looking at now to the left we'll zoom in on here is what uh, was the museum annex but it's closed today uh, they're getting ready to move all of the airplanes that are in it which include uh, President Truman's Air Force One the DC-6 President Eisenhower's uh, constellation that he used as Air Force One over to the new addition to the regular Air Force Museum, and they'll all be housed in this one area. The uh, tower there at the right, and the office space down below it, and let's see if we can zoom in a little bit more on that hangar, is where Joe has his office. And this is where the engineering and part of the uh, logistics is uh, located. There's another one of the hangars with the Wright Brothers airplane on it. We're looking through a tree. We're looking at a tower, and I'll put a zoom lens on it in a little while, and I'll tell you a little bit about that tower and the rest of the field. And we're beginning now to come around into the sun, so we'll uh, pan back around to our left out of the sun. This is Wright-Patterson Air Force Bay, Area B. Ground at an F-106. This uh, airplane was developed in 1955, was operational in 1959. It is a, uh, an all-weather airplane it's unique in the fact that the pilot will take the plane off, reach flying altitude, and will turn it over on a guidance system called the MA-1. It's electronic. Uh, it's controlled by the ground. It will be directed to the target area, at which time the various missiles that it carries, it carried uh, two or three different types. One was a Genie missile would be released and uh, would be directed again by the ground to its target. The airplane then would be directed back toward the landing area, the base area, at which time the pilot would retake control of it and would land the airplane. So actually about all the pilot did was just take it off, turn it on uh, automatic control, was directed to the uh, uh, target area, the missiles were released, the ground uh, turned the airplane around and headed it back toward the uh, base and the pilot took over and landed the airplane. We're going to pan around now and the next airplane that we'll be looking at here is the C-119. Sitting here on the ramp area, it's the uh, C-119J. And again, this plane was developed from a World War II prototype, was put into production about 1950, saw service in the Korean War, and it was dubbed the Flying Boxcar. And of course it carried troops, carried material, carried machinery. Uh, it was one where they could parachute jump from, or they could uh, parachute armament from the back of this. But this is a C-119, the Flying Boxcar. I'm sorry. We're looking now at quite an unusual airplane, another taste, another case of American ingenuity. You'll look at this and you'll say, gee, that looks something like a DC-3. Well, you're right. 
It's known to the Air Force as the B-23. It was a DC-3 that in 1939 was converted to a bomber and it was known as the B-23 Dragon. And all it is is a uh, DC-3 with an elongated nose and it had a gun turret on the back of the airplane. Well, this version was uh, faster than the B-18. It was not nearly as successful as was the B-17s or the B-24s, 25s, 26s, or 29s. And this airplane uh, never saw service in any of the war. Many of these, there were only 33 of these built. And after the war, they were declared surplus. And many cargo operators bought these airplanes, converted them back to civilian use, and they were used primarily as cargo planes. We're going to pan around now. And of course, the plane that you'll see coming up, you'll recognize is the B-26. This one is designated the B B-26K. And you know that as they developed an airplane, whether it was a B-20, whether it was a B-26, they would modify it and be a B-26A, further modify it and be a B-26B, and so on down the line. This is designated as the B-26K, and it was the last modification that was made on the B-26s. This airplane saw service of course, is the B-26 in the uh, World War II. It was used in Korea. It was retired again in the mid-1950s. It was reactivated again. All right. What's, what's that plane back there? 1961 and sent to Southeast Asia. And it was one of the first tactical bombers that was used in the uh, Korean conflict. The airplane, again, was finally retired in 1969. And this particular airplane, was brought to the Air Force Museum in uh, 1980, the B-26K. And we're looking at now is designated the C-7A, built by Fairchild. It's a STOL, S-T-O-L, airplane. It's a, a transport carrier, twin engine, and it's capable of short landings and uh, takeoff, uh, which designates the s TOL, short takeoff or landing. And it was quite a versatile airplane. Again, it was used, uh, developed in the late 1950s, and it was used to transport men and material. It could carry uh, 26 uh, fully equipped paratroopers and was used. But that's the C7A, uh, no longer in service in the Air Force. We're looking here at a uh, a jet reconnaissance plane. There's no plaque designating what the uh, uh, number is, but it's it's an observation plane. It's not armed, and the only identification I could find on it under the uh, canopy on the cockpit it says Lieutenant Jim Glasgow, and uh, that's all we have. But it's a uh, it's a vintage, probably late 50s, early 60s, trainer reconnaissance type of a jet airplane. Vintage airplane. At first, you'll probably say, well, that's another B-29. Well, you're partially right. This is a redesigned and updated version of a B-29. When it first went into service, it was designated as the B-29D. But because of its extensive conversion and modification, it was later designated the B-50 was placed into service in 1947 and in 1949 a B-50 nicknamed the Lucky Lady 2 was the first Air Force airplane to fly non-stop around the world. It was a, a time of 94 hours but it was the B-50 that made the first around the world non-stop flight in, 19, in June of 1949. These planes remained in service and were later replaced by the B-47s, which became the mainstay of the bomber force of the uh, United States Air Force in the late, or in the mid uh, 1950s. But this is a B-50 bomber, 
33 of these bombers were actually made after they were taken out of service as bombers. Many of them were converted into tankers and cargo planes, and they remained in service until about 1960. But this is a B-50 bomber. And a C-133A. This airplane was built in 1954. It was built in designs. There were no prototypes made of this airplane. It was placed into immediate production. It's a four-engine, turboprop airplane. 30 of these were eventually built and placed into service. And at the time, in the mid-1950s, many of these airplanes set records for uh, not only distance flying, but uh, payload covered. One of the records was that this airplane flew a payload of 117,000 pounds at an altitude of 10,000 feet. They were replaced uh, in 1970s uh, by the C-5s, and now they've all been retired. But there were only 30 of these uh, gigantic planes built. They were built from the mid-1950s to 1960. The C-133A. Some German airplanes of World War I and World War II vintage. This airplane is sitting on the uh, apron here. It's kind of dejected. The paint's kind of peeling and in bad shape. But you're looking here at a Russian-built MiG, M-I-G-17. The uh, MiG-15s were developed during the Korean War and were placed into service and a good many American pilots flew against MiG-15s. The MiG-17 is a later version. The fuselage, it says, is about three feet longer. The wings are a little longer and more swept back than were the MiG-15s. And these airplanes were built. They were furnished to 17 various countries by the Russians. Some of them were friendly to the United States, some were not. This particular airplane was given to the United States by the Egyptian government in 1986. And evidently it's sitting here, they're waiting uh, to restore it. But the uh, history of this, uh, the M, uh, MIG-15s that uh, the American F-4s and F-105s during the Korea shot down uh, quite a number of these MiG-15s and MiG-17s. But this is the later version the MIG-17. It is blowing. Seems like everywhere we've been this spring, the wind's blown. We're looking now at a prototype of a supersonic airplane that was built for the Air Force. If you can see through the fence there, the uh, uh, trucks and everything are still in place in this airplane. It's not been put into position yet. It's, uh, it's in a fenced-in area for the uh, general public to get close to it. I don't know what the designation of it is. It uh, has a slight resemblance to the Concorde that uh, is in commercial service now. But it was a prototype, and as I understand, uh, because of its size and bulkiness and whatever, it was never fully developed and made operational as far as the Air Force. But this is a prototype of, of a supersonic uh, airplane for the Air Force. Looking again now at the uh, C-133 at a distance, we're going to look up the uh, apron here toward the uh, museum. You can see the missiles that are set in place now in front of the museum and some of the aircraft. I'm going to pan through here and then in just a minute I'm going to change lenses, put on the telephoto lens. and uh, make another sweep of this area. We're zooming in now. Coming around to the various hangars, the, mu the, the annex to the museum. And again, uh, they've built onto the main museum and they're in the process now of moving the, the equipment and the displays over to the main museum and so we didn't get into the annex. But we'll get that on a later trip out here. 
there again is that weird prototype airplane that the Air Force had developed. Okay, well we've put on the uh, telephoto lens. But we're looking now, of course, at the mural on uh, the hangar depicting the Wright brothers. We'll pan around. That's all logistics. And around here, that's the uh, annex, the tower, uh, the uh, office area where Joe works is hidden from there. We'll go on around. Now I want to get another shot of this tower that sits behind that white dome that you see and tell you a little bit about it some more of the hangars, the areas that are used. Looking now across toward the airstrip and the hill over there, the hill over there in the distance where you can see some of the trucks and other machinery stored. And you can see the runways there in the area. This is was known as a uh, prairie and uh, back up in this hill area here, somewhere were, was where the Wright brothers actually did some of their flying. And this is, of course, the Wright Field. Uh, area B, Wright Patterson. There are the some of the other airplanes sitting on the aprons we saw this morning, waiting to be uh, remodeled and refurbished so they could be brought over to the annex or to the uh, museum, and this tower was built, as Joe says, uh, so they can do some experiments. They have a laser beam that uh, some of the logistics people for the Air Force are developing, and they shoot that laser beam, and they'll shoot it down onto the prairie area that we showed where the uh, runway was. And clear on around down into this area where these trucks and tanks and various things are situated and they'll aim them at a aim this laser beam at a truck or at a tank and they'll destroy it but the tower was built simply to house this uh, laser unit in the twin tower there and it's up toward the top of it and to do experiments with uh, with lasers. And again, we're about ready to leave. We'll pan on around again here. I know I'm going too fast. We'll put the shutter on. Maybe we can pan a little faster here. We'll zoom out a little bit. Of course, you're looking at the 133, looking at the MiG-17, and again, you're looking down toward the Air Force Museum here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Just another view of the apron with the uh, airplane sitting here, the missiles in the background, that tall missile that you see. I'll try and find out what it is background buildings. This first uh, Quonset type building here that you see was the original Air Force Museum. They outgrew it and uh, they later moved over to the uh, annex with this second Quonset hut type building that you see here in the background is the new part of the museum. And they're moving the airplanes see the hangar doors on it. They're moving the airplanes from the annex. It was that if you wanted to go to the annex, you had to catch the subtle shuttle service from the museum and ride it over to the annex. It wouldn't allow you to drive over there and then ride it back. But with the addition of this new building to the uh, museum, they'll be able to house the uh, airplanes here. And it's scheduled to open on uh, April the 30th. 
And so we're about two weeks early to get in and to see it. This is a jet that's coming in now to land at Area A. We're just following it through. We're going to be in the missiles here in a minute. It's out of sight. We'll display in front of the museum. This first one you see that is uh, the olive green and white and black is the Minuteman III missile. The one immediately to the right is the Minuteman I. It's a smaller missile, it was first developed. The Minuteman I, the Minuteman II was an improved version, and finally was the Minuteman III, the larger of the versions. They're intercontinental. The next one that you're looking at is a Juniper. The big one that you're looking at down there is a Titan missile, a gigantic missile, and I forget the name of the one on the end, a uh, smaller missile. It's amazing when you start thinking about these missiles that most of them were developed in the mid-1950s and uh, were implemented and put into place uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. Of course, we're familiar with the Minuteman because these are the missiles that were put in the silos and the, uh, it says the Northern Plains, but uh, they're in the silos in Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Wyoming, and Montana, the Minuteman missiles. We're gonna pan around now and we're gonna look at some various other missiles. At a variety of smaller missiles. The first three here are of uh, a wing nature. Uh, you can see them, they're smaller than are the Titans and the Minutemen's, and they're more mobile. Don't have quite the uh, payloads that some of them do. This one behind the uh, little pine tree is a mobile one could be mounted, the base of it on a truck, could be hauled to the battlefield. I suppose it's a very short range. I'm not sure of the designation of these missiles, and I'm running short of time again, and so I'll pick them up at a later time, but there are four of the more mobile missiles, and this one in particular could be mobile mounted on a truck, a train, or whatever, and be fired from the battlefield. Okay, again, I'm preparing to leave. One last view. Old glory flying in the wind. Stars and stripes. Looking again at the missile display, the flag in the background, the airplanes lined on the aprons, the buildings, the entrance into the United States Air Force Museum. Wright Patterson Field. Dayton, Ohio. Take a view of the parking lot. Some of the trees may get in the way. Oh, that's why I didn't get in the way. I don't want to mess your picture up. No, no, you're not in my way. I'm just taking a picture of the parking lot here. You can see the Saturday afternoon. Beautiful day. A big crowd here at the Air Force Museum, Dayton, Ohio. We came in yesterday afternoon. We spent most of the afternoon here in the uh, museum. Yeah. We only begin to scratch a portion of the material that's here. Yeah, so large.